back. Hi. Welcome, everybody, to Knock Knock I with Dr. Glock and Flecken. I am Dr. Glock and Flecken. This is the weekly series where we talk about all things eyeballs, uh, like one at a time, like one eyeball thing at a time, week after week, until we eventually reach the end of ophthalmology and you're all board-certified ophthalmologists. No, I can't say that. I could get me into trouble. You will not be board-certified ophthalmologists at the end of this long series that might last years. I don't know. Uh, but you will get an honorary uh, uh, title of amateur ophthalmologist from me. How about that? Does that work for everyone? I, I think that's fair. Uh, you are sitting here and, uh, and listening as I spout off all kinds of eyeball knowledge that hopefully you didn't know. Uh, hopefully you're curious about. And uh, I'm excited for today's lesson. <laughs> I shouldn't call it a lesson. That sounds boring. Uh, today's topic, today's um, uh, adventure into uh, ophthalmology land. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, I, I, I want to, I'm still trying to figure out exactly the format that I want to do with these episodes. Uh, I, I always have this like intro type thing where we, you know, clear up some uh, questions people had from prior episodes or, or things I got wrong that people uh, you know, point out to me. Uh, I think today, uh, it, I, I think I'm just going to make it just random. I don't know. Like you, you're just, you're not going to know what I'm going to talk about, uh, at the top here of these episodes. Uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about something that's been on my mind recently. Uh, ever since I went to a, a conference, I'm not going to say what conference it was, but, um, I spoke to a group of med students and residents. And I, I do that commonly when I go to conferences. Uh, the way it works is usually I get brought in to do a keynote at some academic conference. And I always tell the organizers, hey, I'm happy to, you know, do a, uh, another thing for, um, for trainees. I, I really like talking to that's my audience. Those are the, those are the people that, uh, that the, uh, I mean, a lot of people follow me on social media, but I have a really strong uh, uh, audience of trainees out there. And so uh, I always think it's really fun. It's always a good crowd to to talk with residents and fellows and and med students. So I always um, am open to doing that when I go to conferences. And recently, uh, I spoke to a group of trainees, and the the speaker ahead of me uh, was was kind of ending a segment of this little side conference just for trainees. The whole, um, the, the big topic was side gigs. And the speaker that I heard was talking about real estate investing to a large group of doctors and uh, doctors to be who were all, for the most part, in their mid to late 20s, early 30s. And there's nothing wrong with talking about side gigs, um, but it, it just seemed odd to me to have a big topic like that be focused on like buying up real estate and turning it into like short term rentals and holding on to it uh, to make money off it down the road. I don't know. I'd, this this might be like a philosophical thing, like how comfortable are you with like being a landlord and and uh and 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 buying a bunch of property i'm not saying there's anything wrong with that but but it it just seemed like a strange topic to present to a group of people at that stage in their life because as a resident you're you're very um uh, impressionable uh you're just starting out your career in medicine you generally have a lot of debt and so the idea of a side gig is pervasive in healthcare. I, I I've found this interesting because it does seem like the the consensus is you have to have a side gig in medicine. Like it's it's what are you doing? How do you not have a separate thing that you do that makes money from your job as a physician? And I'm I'm kind of troubled by where the discourse is around side gigs. Like you have a Facebook group with like tens of thousands of physicians that that it's all about side gigs, about what you can do to make money outside of your job. 
And it makes me wonder, like, what are the reasons that this is happening in healthcare? I think it's probably happening in other sectors of the workforce as well, but it, it's just really coming on a lot in healthcare or we're just like, or we're just talking about it more. We're seeing it more people more focused on it. And a lot of you are probably thinking, what are physicians? You're making a ton of money. Like, why are you focused? Why are you trying to make money doing a separate thing? I think there's several parts to this, right? One is just how generally unhappy so many people are in healthcare because of you know the pandemic and and just uh, you know the the insurance companies and and their regulations and all this vertical integration that's going on private equity sweeping up all these practices everybody's an employee now and they're working for these corporate overlords that i think a lot of people are looking for maybe not a way out of healthcare maybe they are i think a lot of people probably are but they see a side gig as a way to to decrease their dependence on their healthcare job almost like like taking off a little bit of the weight like oh at least no no matter what my employer does with my my what no matter what reimbursement does or no matter what the hospital does in terms of my salary i at least i have this other thing that can bolster my income or just make me feel a little bit less stressed about my healthcare job because there's a lot of stress in healthcare. So I think that that's probably a big part of it. Um, do physicians make a lot of money? Yeah, we 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 have a a very comfortable life. We do, and so the, going back to this 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 conference, uh, I I do have a bit of a problem with how the issue of side gigs is approached to trainees because. They're under, again, I I mentioned they're starting their career and they have a lot of debt. And so they, it's easy to convince them that they have to have a side gig because how are you going to pay off your debt? Look at, there's all this doomsday of, you know, naysayers in medicine, like look how terrible things are. And yeah, there's a lot of things that are terrible, but there's still a lot of good things about practicing medicine. And so trainees med students they're getting all this information there about things like side gigs and like you got to do it like what are you going to do to make extra money outside of your job in healthcare so the point the real point i want to say about this whole thing about side gigs is you, you don't have to have a side gig it's okay if you just want to have your job taking care of patients in medicine and that's it Okay, physicians, you're going to be fine. Even those are in, that are paying back a ton of student loans, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars in student loans, which is not uncommon. Uh, you're going to be okay. Like it's you don't have to have a separate. You can just focus on your job, the thing you've wanted, you've been wanting to do for most of your life. You can just do that. And you, and now I say this, I know all of you are thinking, well, you got a side gig. Yes, I do have a side gig. All right, I'm saying this as someone I acknowledge I do have a side gig. So what I'll, the other thing I'll say is that there's a difference between doing something you love to do and that you're passionate about that ends up making you some money and then cho- going after a thing that for the sole purpose of making money there, there's there's a difference here and the route i went with my side gig is is the first route right i was very passionate i've been very passionate about comedy for a long time so i was just doing comedy for free on social media and i worked at it just because i loved it i loved doing it it was my hobby i just i just enjoyed it and it got to the point where I had the opportunity to start making money doing it. But the initial motivation was one out of passion, uh, joy, uh, excitement. That's what drove it. And eventually, yeah, I started making some money from it. And it's pretty good money. And, and, and I'm happy doing it. It's a, it's a great little benefit. If the money went away, would I still do it? Yeah, probably. I may not spend as much time doing it as I do now, but I mean, yeah, 
I, I, I just, I can't imagine my life without comedy. Contrast that to telling a group of young doctors, this is how you make money in real estate. You should consider doing this. You should do. And it's like, it's no longer, it's not, it doesn't feel like a passion type of thing. It is whenever you are starting something else to, for the full, sole, sole purpose of making money, it's no longer like a fun hobby. It's a job. And everybody in healthcare is so burned out right now. Morale is so low across the board in healthcare that I hate the idea of making, especially young physicians, feel like they got to find a side gig so they can make more money that is completely separated from any kind of passion or excitement about whatever that thing is. Because then you just, you have two jobs. And that's not a recipe to help with burnout or to prevent burnout or to improve your mental well-being. No, you're taking on two jobs. And you already got one job being a doctor. That's extremely difficult. And so uh, it, it just, I encourage everyone, just be careful with how you're framing the idea of a side gig, especially in medicine, um, because it's not, something you have to do. You can do it. I do it. There's nothing wrong with it. But but just don't let it affect your mental health, your well-being. Uh don't think about it in terms of I have to have a side gig or I'm not going to survive or whatever it is people are telling you. That's not true. It's okay to just take care of patients. That's enough. All right, let's take a quick break. We'll come back with our topic of the day. All right, we have today a 39-year-old patient who came in with a history of migraines and visual auras. So when you have migraines, you can have these visual phenomena, and oftentimes they're like kind of twinkly lights or geometric shapes or you know people describe them in all, all the different ways. But that migraines with auras, that's been going on since the teenage years. Uh, and he presents to clinic with a primary chief complaint of seeing a snowstorm in his vision for several years. He describes it as a kind of constant bilateral. So it's in both, he checks each eye separately and it's, he sees it in both eyes. TV static. That's how he describes it. It fills the entire visual field, and it's worse at night or when he gets anxious, but it's always there. Sometimes it gets a little bit worse, but it's always there. And he's wondering what's going on. Still sees 2020. Vision's great. In fact, he's been having these symptoms for two or three years and just thought, hey, you know, I think this is kind of funky, funky, <laughs> funny, funky. As I said, I was trying to say funny and funky at the same time, funky. Um, I guess that does work to it. And maybe that's the origin of funky. I don't know. Anyway, anyway, it's, uh, um, and it's like, Hey, let's just get it checked out. And so this is a classic description of a condition called visual snow. Several of you wanted me to talk about this and it's a really great topic and not one. I'm going to warn you right now. We don't know a lot about this condition. All right. Uh, it's a it's a condition that manifests with these persistent, positive visual hallucinations, basically. It's a, like, a, like a, a type of hallucination. Now, before we go further, let's talk about hallucinations. Because I want to make sure we're all on the same page. We know what I'm talking about. Uh, or I know what I'm talking about. So what exactly is the, like, the definition of a hallucination? And how does that differ from other visual phenomena, like an illusion? Like That's a common... Uh, you know, two descriptors that you can use for things you see. Illusion versus hallucination. They're very different things. Sometimes there are people try to use them interchangeably, but they're, they're, they're not the same thing. So hallucinations are a perception of something that is not based on sensory input. Okay? The thing is not there. But your brain is interpreting it as being there. So to the person seeing a hallucination, 
it is a real thing. They are seeing it. All right, it's 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 very real to that person. So a great example of this is um, is Charles Bonnet syndrome. Some of you may have heard about this. This is a um, uh, a, a a type of visual hallucination where you get either formed or unformed objects that start appearing in the visual field of a person who has had significant vision loss. So we see it a lot in people with very severe macular degeneration or in people that have had strokes because both of those things can can basically wipe out large portions of your visual field, either your peripheral vision or your straight ahead vision. And what happens, and again, the underlying etiology or the, the physiologic mechanism is, is, we don't know a lot about it, but uh, basically the, the brain just tries to fill in that gap in the vision with objects. Sometimes they're very simple. People see dots or flashes of light or, um, or uh, you know, squares, circles. Sometimes they are very formed. They are very real. They are, uh, I've had one patient that described seeing, sitting on his porch and seeing a little girl swinging in the yard. Now, one key point to, to, to remember is that the difference between like a hallucination and a delusion is that with a with with this type of hallucination the patient knows that thing is not real a delusion people very very much believe like that is real that thing is real with a with a visual hallucination the patient knows the guy sitting on that porch knows that that kid is not real and and so that's why a lot of people they're actually afraid to bring it up to their friends and family and to their doctor because they don't want to be seen as, quote, you know, crazy. I've heard that. People say, I don't want you to think I'm crazy. But it's, 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 it's not a mental health type of thing. It's just their brain is trying to fill in that gap in their vision with something. The, the, the brain, the occipital lobe where your vision cortex is, it wants to see things. And, and so it just fills in with either formed or unformed hallucinations. And it's kind of sad, you know, because, you know, pe people that, that people feel nervous about, about speaking up about these, these things that they know are not real, but they are, they, they look very real. They, they're, they're real things. Uh, and, and so it's okay to like ask people, I, I think it's probably a good idea, especially for your patients that you see with a, have a tremendous amount of vision loss like letting them know, hey, you know, sometimes there's this thing called Charles Bonnet syndrome. You might see things that you know are not real, but uh, that's just your brain trying to fill in the gaps. And 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 that can be very comforting to to patients to know, okay, it's not just me. Like I and it's a known thing and and it's accepted as a, a, a known thing. No one's going to try to like, you know, send me to a, a, a psychiatric hospital because of this. Uh, so that is hallucinations. And so visual snow is just a form of hallucination that TV static. And, it, it, you know, I, I've never experienced, I've seen like uh, uh, artist renderings of what this looks like. People love to do that with vision type problems. They, they do that with macular degeneration and glaucoma. And it's actually really interesting to see how artists can, that are having vision problems draw their own visual symptoms. But um, uh, the visual snow, it's a hallucination. Those things, the, the static is not there and the patient knows it's not there, but they still see it. And uh, the difference between a hallucination and an illusion Illusions happen when you you misinterpret something that is real in your environment. Um, I, I'm trying to think of a type of I can't think of it like a, 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 a just an optical illusion that that you would see on the internet or whatever. Uh, you know that that stimulus, that visual stimulus, is is really there. Your brain just is not something is going on with that thing, and it's causing the brain to misinterpret it. 
All right. So it, it kind of throws you for a loop there, but it's a real, a real stimulus in your environment. That's the difference between a hallucination and an illusion. Uh, so with visual snow, uh, again, people uh, it, it can describe the, 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 the snow the, the, in different ways, but typically it's kind of their small little TV static type things. Oh, I realized, though, that this is another one of those things. I think I had one last week as well. Like I say things and I assume that people under the age of 30 are going to know what I'm talking about. Like how many people in their like 20s or younger have ever seen TV static? I, I don't know. Probably not. Uh, but it, anyway, it's, you know, maybe I'm not giving you enough credit. You probably all know what TV static is. But uh, anyway, uh, it's it occurs most often in younger patients. It has an average age of onset in the late 20s. That's when people start noticing it. No sex predilection. So male, female, it's, it, it happens to everyone. Um, and about 40 percent of patients uh, who have visual snow describe having symptoms since childhood. And then it just kind of comes on. And once you have it, it's, it's hard to get rid of it. In fact, you can't really get rid of it. Now, fortunately, visual snow is not a progressive thing. Like it's not going to get worse over time. Once you have it, you just kind of have it. Now, there are some case reports where if you have like a severe anxiety type event, panic attacks, like it can temporarily get worse. Uh, but then you kind of come back to your baseline and you just have this, this static. Now, it sounds to someone that doesn't have visual snow, it sounds awful, right? It's like, oh, my God, you constantly see this visual snow. But it's, it's not typically debilitating. In fact, I've never seen a patient that's really debilitated by it. They're curious about it. Sometimes it's a little annoying in certain conditions, like like vision or um, lighting conditions. You know, if it's like bright lights, it can be more challenging or, or dim lights. Um, but I've never had someone come in and is, is like distraught upset crying like please get rid of my visual snow it's it's uh it's kind of like in the background there and and people live with it it's it's very interesting and we don't have in fact before i started recording i was trying to look up research to figure out like what exactly you know what do we know about visual snow and i'll be honest you guys not much like there's there's this is a relatively new area of research i don't think this diagnosis has been around that long uh, and, um, it does seem to be more common in people that have a history of migraines. So maybe there's some kind of migraine related thing and you just get this persistent visual phenomenon that lasts most of your life. Um, but, uh, uh, as far as, as far as like, there are diagnostic criteria for it, but it's, it, once you hear the description from people, it's a pretty easy diagnosis to make. Um, a lot of people will end up you know, getting an MRI just to, because there, there are certain visual phenomenon that, that can be a sign of something like an occipital stroke or an occipital tumor. Um, I've had a patient that came in describing cracked glass in their vision, uh, that ended up being a, an, an occipital stroke. Uh, and so you gotta be careful with any kind of new onset vision, um, uh, changes. But again, typically these symptoms are coming on for people early in life where they're less likely to have things like a stroke or a tumor. So um, I think it's not unreasonable though to do a workup to get an MRI for, uh, for symptoms that might be visual snow, but you're just not sure about it. Uh, and there's really no good evidence to suggest uh, an effective treatment. There have been case series of people trying SSRIs, you know, uh, you know, medications for like depression or anxiety, very common medications that some seem to help, but there's, we don't have enough to go on to like consider that a standard of care. Uh, and again, vision function is fine. People are able to drive and do their hobbies and activities and generally doing okay. So, um, it's just kind of an interesting thing. And, and, and a lot of times just reassurance to people is what you need. It's, it's very, 
sometimes being a physician is kind of hard and we, we, we bring it on ourselves sometimes because of our perfectionist nature. We always want to have an answer. We always want to have not, not even just an answer. We always want to have a solution to, to, for anybody that comes in to see us. Like they're here, they're like, we just feel like we have to have all the answers. We have to be able to help this person. Uh, and so it's hard to, to have someone come in with this thing and, and, and being like, I just really, you know, I can't do anything to make this problem better. And so it's, and that's always hard to, to say, uh, but that doesn't mean you're not helping, right? With a diagnosis like this, you're at least giving them an answer. Oh, that's what's going on. And be like, yeah, and we're doing research on it. You know, there's people working on this and, uh, you know, and so if, if something comes up, you know, I'll, I'll let you know, I'll keep seeing you back every once a year and, and, uh, you know, keep you up to date on any latest advancements. Like, that's great. That's, that's a great thing to give to somebody. Um, and so, yeah, you don't have to have all the answers. Often we don't, uh, and, and, you know, but that doesn't mean we're not doing something. So, um, hopefully that helps all of you visual snow people out there. <laughs> in fact, I have a funny story about visual snow. Uh, there was an intern year. I think it was intern year or my first year of residency. Uh, we had a, a lecture early on where someone was, was lecturing on like visual phenomenon, visual disturbances and visual snow being one of them. And then like uh, somebody, I think it was an intern or resident or maybe a med student, uh, like raised their hand and was like, I just learned that I have visual snow. <laughs> so it's like I said, it's something like people are like, oh, there's something going on in my vision, but you know, it's not too bothersome. You just kind of ignore it. And then they find out later, oh, turns out visual snow. So very interesting. So thanks for that suggestion, you guys. I love I I'm all of these these topics I'm choosing, they're coming from you. You know that, right? Like, let me know. Let me know in the comments, wherever you watch this either or listen to it, either on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube. Uh, um, let me know, you know, what you're what you what you want to hear about. What kind of weird eyeball thing are you experiencing these days? I'm happy to help out. Uh, OK, so. This leads me to the don't do that eyeball tip of the week. I, I feel like I'm going to run out of don't do that eyeball tips. <laughs> Like eventually I'm going to run out of telling you things not to do with your eyeballs. Uh, but not yet today. I always try to like relate it to the topic at hand. Today's don't do that eyeball tip of the week is dismissing hallucinations. Um, because it, 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 it's just the basic thing is like, just acknowledge to this, to the people that might come to you either as a family member or a friend or a patient and tell you they're seeing this thing that they know is not real, like acknowledge that it's real to them. I think it's a good thing. It's, it's, it gives people peace of mind and, and it is real to them. That's the thing. Yeah. You don't see it, but they really are seeing these hallucinations. And, uh, and so don't dismiss it. Don't say it's all in your head. I mean, technically it is all in their head. Like literally it's in their head, but, but you know what I mean? Like, like acknowledge it, uh, show, show that empathy that we all have, uh, and, um, and just say, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you know, uh, this is, uh, I, I understand like this, this is really, really seeing this. Let's go try to figure out why you're seeing it. So anyway, don't dismiss it. Oh, I didn't write down an op ophthalmology fun fact for you guys. Oh, wait, here's one. Here's something. Uh, there's, uh, this thing, it's another visual phenomenon. It's called palinopsia, palinopsia, P-A-L-I-N-O-P-S-I-A. It is, you, you guys, we've talked about, I think after images before, like you're looking at a light, like a bright light. I'm looking at one right now. And then you look off away from it and you still see like an imprint of that bright light. That's because your photoreceptors are all like depolarized and activated. And so there's, it's still going to persist. Well. Palinopsia is where you have an abnormal perseveration of visual images, not just lights, anything like you're looking at, uh, you're, you're looking at a tree and you look away and you still see that tree briefly. 
that can be a sign of some kind of tumor or lesion or a lesion or or white matter lesion in MS or a, or a um, stroke or something. So it could be a sign that something's going on. And it's a very strange, it's not like an after image, you guys. This is like any object, you just, it can persist in your visual field, even though you know you're definitely not looking at that thing still. So it's called palinopsia. You can see it in a lot of different, um, a lot of different uh, things. Uh, it most commonly occurs in, if something's happening in the right hemisphere. I just read that on my page. I, 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 I can't tell you why that is. That's kind of interesting though, right hemisphere. So we're talking either, it's like a parietal lobe. I think it's probably a parietal lobe type of thing. Anyway, you have the vision of the, the optic radiations, all like the signal from your brain. It's, it's, there's so much of your brain that's dedicated to vision. Sorry, neurologists, but we claim a lot of the brain. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you're not the only ones, you know that, right? Uh, I'm, I mean, yeah, you, I do send all my like vague headache complaint patients to you that I can't figure out. But, you know, still, we still claim a lot of the brain. All right. Now it's time for, that was your ophthalmology fun fact, palinopsia. Uh, let's uh, wrap things up with a question from a glockum fleck. That's what I'm going to call this segment from now on. Question from a glockum fleck. One of my kids is going to come in and ask a question. In your eye, what is the color ring around your pupil for? That is a fantastic question, my beautiful little glockum fleck. Um, so the color ring around your pupil is your iris. I think a lot of people know that. Uh, what is it for? Well, it's like your camera aperture. Your eye is a camera. I mean, basically, it's, it's kind of, it's a lot of ways functions as a camera. But um, uh, the iris is, has movement to it, right? It can move in. It can constrict with bright light. It dilates with dim light to allow more or less light to come into the eye, allowing you to see in different lighting conditions. And it also, it's colored based on some different things. Genetics uh, is a big part of it. Basically, how much pigment you have in the iris can give you, will give you different colors. Uh, and, um, and, and it's just based on genetics. And so, uh, that's why people who have, uh, who, who are, who have albinism, they don't have any pigment in their iris and you can actually see light coming through the iris and it makes it, uh, for a number of reasons, people with albinism, uh, oculocutaneous albinism have, have different vision problems. Uh, or problems with their eye, but um, so you need that pigment in the iris to help block light, and it can be different colored pigments. But um, the pigment blocks light, and um, uh, and then the iris moves in and out, uh, limiting the amount of light you see and giving you good vision in all different lighting conditions. So yeah, great question. Question about the iris. It's so it's 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 good. I love uh, questions like that because. I, you know how long it's been since I've like tried to explain, <laughs> you could tell, I didn't know she was going to ask that question. Like, uh, I have to, it's good exercise, I think, for anybody in healthcare or who takes care of patients or is a, is a educator, uh, to, to get basic questions and then try to explain that thing in a basic way. Cause we have this, we we're so, we live in such a, like a high level um, uh, a, a high level for our field that it's, it's, it's kind of challenging sometimes to like bring it down and be like, okay, well, what is someone who doesn't know the basics? What do they need to know to understand? And I, I, I love it. I love it. So thank you for that. And thank you all for listening. I'm your host, Will, Will Flannery, also known as Dr. Glockenflecken. Uh, thanks to our executive producers, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, and Shanti Brick. Our editor and engineer is Jason Portizo. Our music is by Omer Binsby. I decided to try to do an actual outro for these. It was, it was very exciting, right? Uh, knock Knock High is a human content production. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time.
Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.